All of you are now on air. All right, let's have a prayer. We'll get started. <clears throat> Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for the day. We thank you for not leaving us here in this world to just wonder about how things got here, about who you are, our relationship with you. We're thankful that you inspired the apostles and the writers to write the New Testament and the Old Testament so that we might see your handiwork in it and know that you exist and be able to serve you. We pray that you would help us as we study about Paul and about the proof that he gives that uh, his message was not something contrived by men, but something that you uh, revealed to him through the Spirit. And so we praise you for that, and we thank you, and we thank you for the record of that. We pray that you be with all those who are having difficulty in the flesh, that you'd be with them and help them, and uh, help our country during this uh, COVID uh, thing that we have going on, and uh, help the individuals who are suffering from it to be relieved. And we pray that you just give us a, a sense of, of um, security in you. I pray that people turn to you. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so we're looking at Galatians chapter 1, and we're actually down at verse 17. And I just want to remind you, though, in your charts, you have that chart of your uh, missionary journey. And so I uh, want you to turn there for just a second and notice if you would, that in that in Paul's first missionary journey, which by the way, we're going to be talking about in just a couple of minutes. And so let me just go ahead and put it up here on this on this timeline for you. This is going to be Paul's missionary journey right here. This is his first missionary journey. We're going to be noticing that in just a minute, but I want you to want to just put it up there in the timeline for you. And so if you, if you look at that little um, map of it or chart of it, he starts in Antioch and goes up to uh, Perga and, and Pisidia and Antioch and, and uh, Iconium and Lystra and Derby, and then he goes back down and comes back to Antioch. And so that's that missionary journey that we're going to talk about in just a minute. As far as the, the uh, book of Galatians is concerned, uh, you have an outline. And so take a real quick look at your outline. Let me put it up here on the board so these people can see it. Uh, you have a, an outline that's over here. I believe this is it. Yeah, uh, you have an outline. And so what we've looked at already in Paul's um, introduction in chapter one is we looked at the first 15 verses, which talk about his introduction, the author, uh, the author's companions, the fact that he's addressing the, the churches of Galatia, the blessings that he's going to give to people and the means for the blessing and the glory given in the first five verses. And then in, in uh, verses six through 10, he talks about the real reason why he's writing to the people of Galatia, and why is he writing to the people of Galatia? Oh, okay, because there's confusion about how it is that they're saved, because somebody came in and did what to the gospel? They distorted it. They made it look different so that what they saw really wasn't the gospel, it was something else, and I'm afraid to say that sometimes religion has done that. Um, many religions have done that. They've turned the gospel into religion instead of uh, trying to get people to understand what the gospel is. And so Paul is, is upset with these individuals, and, and that's the reason why he, he tells them in Galatians chapter 1 and down here at verse um, um, 6, he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. So remember, as Paul preaches the gospel, Paul is preaching about a person. He says, you have deserted him. And of course, we know that this him is Christ. So the gospel has to do with Christ. It's not, it's not a system that saves you. It's not a set of rules that saves you. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what saves us. And so when we deal with people, we need to deal with people understanding that. That is possible for individuals not to necessarily agree on every subject, but what matters is, are, are we striving to have a relationship with Christ uh, and depending on that relationship for the purpose of uh, our redemption and of, of sustaining that relationship with God. And so uh, he says that they were, they distorted the gospel. And then he came down in verse, in verse 11 and began to talk to them about, about his, his history, the history of his life. And he pointed out that uh, he wanted them to know about the gospel that he preached was not according to men. And we talked about that last week. What does that mean? Not according to men. 
Okay, it's from God. He didn't get it from people. He didn't get it from, he didn't learn it from people. He didn't learn it from a book. Uh, you and I could say we got it from God, but we had to read it in a book. Paul got it directly from God. He wrote the book, or at least part of the book that we have. And he wrote it, and so it, it, it came exactly through him. And, and so it, he points out in verse 12 that he didn't receive it from men, nor was he taught it, so he didn't go to some school. And then he reminded them of his former manner of life, which would have been over here on our little timeline here. Here's Paul's former manner of life. And as Paul speaks about his former manner of life, what kind of person was he? Right, he's persecuting Christians. And he did that because he just didn't like religious people. All right, because he was following the Judaism. Very good. He wasn't following the Old Testament. He's following Judaism. And Judaism is a, is a um, interpretation of the Old Testament. And they began to follow the interpretation of the Old Testament instead of the Old Testament, kind of like people today who, who say that you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. And by that, they mean you're supposed to go to church on, on uh, Saturday. But there's no place in the Bible where it says to go to church on Saturday. You want to keep the Sabbath, it just means don't go to work. And that's all it means to keep the Sabbath. But uh, what's happened is, is that they have interpreted it that way. And before you know it, people think that's what you got to do. You got to go to church on, on uh, the Sabbath, which is Saturday. But there's no place in scripture where it says that. And that's because of their ancestral traditions with where that came from. And so he, uh, he points out his former manner of life, that uh, he was totally dedicated to what they would call the uh, Judaism and the practice of Judaism. He was of the strictest sect that followed Judaism, which was a Pharisee. <coughs> and, so, and so therefore, he's telling them basically that on this side, his former manner of life would indicate that he had a bunch of baggage and a bunch of learning that wasn't correct because that's what happened. You know, as you go through life, you pick up a bunch of stuff that's not correct. And it takes a long time sometimes for us to stop thinking like that. Okay, especially if we thought it was true. And all of a sudden we find the real way that we're supposed to be. And as we find the real way we're supposed to be, it's hard to drop the baggage that we have. And, and a matter of fact, it kind of influences the things that we believe and the things that we read and so we read the things according to the way we used to think. And that's why Jesus in the New Testament said that the, the, the gospel is like trying to put uh, new wine into old wineskins. What happens with the new wine when you put it into old wineskins? It bursts. Because when you put it into, into uh, old wineskins, the, the wineskins have stretched already. You put in new wine that's going to stretch it again. It's going to burst. He says, that's the way the gospel is when you try to put it into, into thinkings and attitudes that we've learned from the world instead of learned from God. And so he's, he's pointing that out when, he, when he's pointing out his, his previous uh, manner of life. He's pointing out that there's no way on his own that he would have changed so quickly and so radically as he did in Acts chapter 9 where he, where he was converted. And that's what he's pointing out to them. And remember uh, why is he pointing that out to these people as he's writing Galatians? Well, why is he pointing that out to them? Well, why do they care about his former manner of life? Or what does that have to do with the context of, of Galatians? They were afraid of him? Well, okay. They consider him not being one of the original apostles. And so, and so therefore they didn't think that he was inspired and got his information from God. And so therefore when Paul taught the Galatian brethren, he taught them a little skewed. And so when the other Judaizers came in to, to Galatia, they corrected what Paul lacked. And that's what they're, that's what they're getting at. Or that's what Paul's getting. But Paul's saying, no, the gospel I learned wasn't from men. I didn't learn it from men. I didn't get it from people. So I have the true gospel. And what you guys were taught was a distorted gospel. And so we need to remember that. That it's easy for us to be taught a distorted gospel uh, when we don't follow the, you know, what the, what the gospel principles really are. Uh, and so we're down here at verse 14. But that's kind of the end of the sentence. It actually starts in verse 15 of Galatians chapter 1. So if you take a look at your notes there, in verse 15, uh, the notes that I gave you that you have, uh, they, they might help you a little bit in being able to understand some of these things. Remember that my notes uh, aren't the Bible. 
I'm just giving them to you to help you and they might hinder you more. So remember what's important is the text is what's important. So beginning of verse 15, he says, but when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles I did not immediately consult with, with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to, to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So in here, he begins to tell them about when God appeared to him. And when God appeared to him, we understand that was in Acts chapter 9. So right here, you have Acts 9. And here's where the Lord appeared to him. In Acts 9, 1 through 9 is where the Lord appeared to him. And, and he says in verse 16, to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So his principle here is that I'm going to tell you that I didn't have time to study with people. I didn't get this from the other apostles. I didn't get it because I went to some preaching school. I didn't get it because I spent a long time at church. And, and you know, at church, I, I learned these things. That's not where I got them from. And so verse 17, he says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. So he says, from Acts 9, he did not immediately go up to Jerusalem. Now, I want us to go to Acts chapter 9 for just a minute, because I want us to see the connection where this works. So this is Acts chapter 9, and Paul was converted here in verses 1 through, oh, down to about verse uh, 18. And so in, in verse 18 uh, was the end of Paul's conversion where the Lord appeared to him. Uh, hey, Alton, good to see you. And verse 19 says in, in Acts 9, we're in Acts 9, verse 19, he says, and he took food and was strengthened. And for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. So he says, during this time here, immediately, he was with the people in Damascus. He was in Damascus. And let's see what he was doing in Damascus. Was he learning? Was he going to a, a preaching school? Was he sitting at the feet of the apostle? What was he doing? Uh, it says, and immediately he began, to, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the son of God. So what he began to do right here, right here, is he began to preach. And what was it that he began to preach? He began to preach two things. What were those two things he began to preach according to to Acts 9 and verse 20. Okay? That Jesus is the Son of God and he is the Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. So, how could he go from his former manner of life where he persecuted Christ? He was totally convinced that Jesus was dead totally convinced that Jesus was a fraud, totally convinced that people that were following him were following a false god, even to the point where he would give his word in order to have them executed. How in the world did he go from there to the very same day that he was baptized, him going out after he ate food, going into the synagogues and preaching that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's the Christ? Well, of course, the Holy Spirit had to be upon him. And if you take a look at Acts chapter 9, and you see verse 17, Ananias came to him and said, <clears throat> so Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, to, the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may gain, regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So as soon as Paul was baptized, he was filled with the Holy Spirit because that's what happened with the apostles so that they could then go out and preach the message without flaw. And so he went out and he preached it and he went to Damascus. But we read that it, that it says over here, uh, let's read it first of all, let's read a little bit more in Acts chapter 9, verse 21 says, all those hearing him continue to be amazed and were saying, is, uh, is this not he? who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests. And so when the people heard him proclaiming Jesus, they said, isn't this the guy who's supposed to be Christians? Isn't that this guy? And then he came to Damascus for the purpose of binding Christians. And he had authority. He even had a letter 
from the chief priest in order to do that? You know, now, when they say that, there would have been Jews there that accompanied Paul. You remember that when Paul saw the light, he said the people around him saw the light, but they didn't understand the voice. So there were Jewish people who saw what happened to Paul and who understood what happened to Paul, who could have said, no, that didn't happen. But they're the ones who are saying he's the one who, in fact, came to, to persecute Christians, but now all of a sudden he's not. And I'm telling you this because I, I want you to see how the Bible connects like this. You know, it, it fits hand in glove. Um, uh, uh, the Galatian account is indifferent from what we have in the other in the other writings. And so you have these two different sources of, of witnesses that basically say the same thing and get us to understand the, the same thing. And that's the reason why we're doing this. But what I want you to notice in verse 21, it says, uh, and this is Acts 9, 21, and those who were hearing him continually, uh, uh, continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who call on his, uh, in his name a a and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounded the Jews living in Dama at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. So the very same scriptures he used to use in the Old Testament to prove that Jesus wasn't the Christ. He's now using for what? To prove that he is the Christ. And how could he do that? Something had to change in his head. Something had to change. And so what changed, of course, was the Holy Spirit was now directing him and helping him understand those things. And so therefore, he kept, he kept doing that. Now, verse 23 says, when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their, but their plot became known to Saul and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by, by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him uh, in a large basket. So there it says that Paul left Damascus. I don't know if I can get all this in here. He left Damascus in a basket. Okay, here's a little basket he's in, so we know it's a basket. He, he left Damascus. So from here to here, we have Paul leaving Damascus, okay? And, and then it says in verse 26, and when he, had, uh, when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to, he was trying to associate uh, with, with the disciples. And so it says when he left Damascus, he came to Jerusalem. So right here is the first time he comes to Jerusalem. Right there, I, I don't know if you can read that or not. I'm, I'm trying to get it all on the timeline. So he says he came to Jerusalem right here. So he leaves, the, he leaves Damascus and comes to Jerusalem. But if you go back to, to Galatians' account, and you look at what it said in Galatians, it kind of sounds like this was immediate. Or, or I'm sorry, if you, if you listen to Acts, it kind of sounds like this was immediate. That right after he was baptized, that he then, you know, a couple days later went to Jerusalem because he got run out of, of uh, Damascus. But uh, I want you to look over here at, at uh, Galatians chapter 1 with me. And let's notice what he says happened because something happened in between that. Uh, in Galatians 1 and down here at verse, <clears throat> at verse uh, 17, it says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. Well, according to Acts, he went up to Jerusalem over here. And he left Damascus, right? That's what it sounds like. But, but listen to what this says. He says, beginning in verse 17, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So in between here, when Paul was in Damascus his conversion and him going over here, in between there, there was another trip. Where did he go there? Where does it say he went there? He went to Arabia. And, and Brother Leroy asked last week, you know, what did he do in Arabia? Uh, and I told him that he was going to have to wait today for an answer. And here's the answer. I don't know. And, and, and that's a good question. Some people believe, and again, this is what some people believe. There's no place in the Bible where it says, while I was in, in Arabia, this is what happened. Okay? It's interesting that he was in Arabia for three years. How long was Jesus' ministry here? 
when he started his ministry. How long was it? Three About three years, maybe a little bit longer. But we understand that sometimes when they talk years, they're not exact. You know, it's just like you and I. You know, I I, I, I went shopping all day. Of course, we understand that you weren't actually shopping. You know, twenty four hours a day. Uh, and, and so, but I want you to understand that he was in Arabia for three years. Some people believe that during those three years, God was appearing to him and was revealing all the things that were revealed to the apostles when they were actually with Jesus. Now, is that true? I don't know. Brother Leroy, I'll tell you another one in just a minute. Sure. No, I was Moab, I think. Wasn't that Moab or, or was it Edom? It was Moab, I believe. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I have. I, I could probably find out for you, but off. And my and my answer, like I told you, is I don't know. All, all, all I know is he went. Yes. Okay. It says in Acts, he went, uh, Ananias went to him, Ananias baptized him, he went to Jerusalem. Right, but here's the thing. No, uh, Ananias baptized him, he preached in Damascus. He preached in Damascus. And it says, and some, and some time passed, and then the people in Damascus wanted to throw him out. And then he went to Jerusalem, right? right. And what this is telling you is, in that meantime, where it says, and some a number of days passed by, there was actually a three-year trip to Arabia. So that's when he went to Arabia. So he, he started preaching in Damascus. He went to Arabia for three years. Then he comes back to Damascus, and then they throw him out in the basket. Or, or he gets let down in the basket because they're out to get him. So he didn't go to Jerusalem for at least four years almost before the first time he ever went. Yes. A little off the subject, okay. Right. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean they, they, they had the, the gift of they had the gift of tongues, so he could speak whatever language he needed to speak. <laughs> yep. Now another another idea, and this is just an idea because we don't know. Like I said, we, we don't really know what Paul was doing there other than preaching. We know that he went there to preach. Okay. Uh, but some people also suggest that that might have been the time where Paul had these visions with God in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where, you know, the, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Let me read that for you a little bit. It says uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1 says, boasting is not necessary, though it is not profitable. I'm sorry, boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable, but I, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, that would be about the same time period as Arabia, when you, when you figure when he wrote the book of Corinthians. Yeah, yes, he is. But uh, uh, if, if you figure about the time that Corinthians happened, uh, and, and not so much when he was written, but the actual time that Corinthians was, was, was recorded and he sent it off uh, to the time that Paul went into Arabia would be about the same time period. So some people believe this is some of the stuff that happened to him while he was there, okay? And it says, uh, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, uh, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And we know what the first heaven is, right? Where the sky is. Second heaven is where the planets are. What's the third heaven? That's where God is. So he says he went up to the third heaven, and I, and I know, uh, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. And so, so therefore, some people suggest that that's when Paul was away in Arabia. And he points out in verse five, he says, or, or uh, on behalf of such a man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except in regard to, to my weaknesses. And so some people believe that that's what Paul was doing in Arabia, was getting these visions. So the answer, uh, uh, Brother Leroy, is I don't know. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 
Right? Yep. Okay. Your 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 guess is good. Your guess is good as mine. No, it wouldn't wouldn't have been wouldn't have fit with the necessary time period from when the time Paul wrote because in First Corinthians he said fourteen years ago. So the time time period wouldn't fit that that well. <clears throat> okay, so that's the best I can do with that. So uh, Galatians one seventeen says, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. So he was in Damascus when he first converted, started preaching, went into Arabia, then returned to Damascus. And when he returned to Damascus, that's when he got in trouble with the people in Damascus. And they had the disciples had to lower him down in the basket so that he could go off uh, to Jerusalem. So that's the first time we find him coming over to Jerusalem uh, is at that time. Now, I said all that so that when we look at Galatians chapter 1, in verse uh, 18, it says, then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. So right after this, he does go to Jerusalem and he stays there for 15 days. 15 days isn't quite enough if you have to learn a gospel. Okay. 15 days isn't quite long enough. And that's what he's pointing out. He says, I did see the, uh, an apostle but that was like almost four years later when I finally saw an apostle. Uh, he said, I was preaching all that time before then. All right. Now, if Paul is a true apostle, does he need the approval of the other apostles? No. Do the other apostles need the approval of Paul? No. Because their approval doesn't come from men. Their approval comes from God. And remember, one of the other things that this shows us is that the New Testament, unlike many other religious writings and the Old Testament is set in history. It is historical. It is not. It is not uh, mystical. It is not um, uh, uh, mysterious. It is not a myth that's made up or a legend that's being passed around that has no base in history. There's actually people who wrote about the history. Uh, Josephus is one of the major historians during this time, and Josephus uh, uh, often mentions different things that connect his history with the activity that's going on in the New Testament. Uh, and so God's word is set in history, and we need to understand that. Now, so verse 18 of Galatians 1 says, Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and stayed with him 15 days. So he did stay with Cephas. By the way, Cephas is another name for who? For Peter, another name for Peter, and I stayed with him 15 days. And it says, but I did not see any other of the apostles except James. So he points out that he did see Cephas. He didn't see any of the other apostles. He said, I did see James, however. Okay. <laughs> he says, uh, and, and he says, um, but I did not see any other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, some people, believe that, that uh, by the way, were there Jameses who were apostles? Yes. Okay. This James here, we know is not those Jameses. Okay. This James is who's referred to as James the Less. Yes, he's the same one that's mentioned as the pillar in, in Galatians 2. But this James, it would be the half-brother of Jesus. That's who this James would be. It, James in 19 is the half-brother of Jesus. Okay? And he's the one who wrote the book of James. All right? Now, the reason I say that is because it says uh, uh, in verse 18 that he saw Cephas, but I did not see any other of the apostles except James. And somebody says, oh, so James is an apostle. But it says except James. Well, no, he's mentioning the fact that he didn't see any apostles, okay? He did, however, see James, and then he, and then he says that he didn't see any, anybody else. So he's not necessarily saying that James is an apostle. What he's saying is that I didn't see any other apostles, except, you know, I did see James, and that doesn't necessarily mean that James has to be an apostle. The reason I point that out is because some people want to use James as an example of the fact that the church is supposed to have continuing um, What's the word called? Um, uh, the replacement of apostles. There's a certain word for that. Uh, 
I can't think of it. Uh, apostolic succession. Some people believe that that you know God's church has apostolic succession, and after a, a, one apostle dies, another apostle is supposed to take his place, and then another apostle takes his place, and and like the Pope, and that's why the Catholic Church says you know that. Uh, uh, Peter was the first pope, and then they can they can name you all the popes that happened from you know that were appointed from there. Uh, same thing with the uh, with the uh, um, Mormon Church. They tell you that God restored the apostleship when Joseph Smith came and established the the Mormon Church, and that he established you know apostles. And then there are churches today that you know in the quote in the Christian group that believe they have you know apostles, and so they listen to their apostles. But I just wanted to point that out to you. This James is actually the brother of Jesus is who's under consideration here. <clears throat> okay. Um, and let's see. I'm looking for a verse here. Oh, didn't find it. Okay, that's all right. <clears throat> so uh, the, the only apostles that you saw during this 15 days was Peter. And he just saw him for, you know, couple of weeks. Now, I, I don't know if that meant that Peter, uh, you know, stayed with, I'm sorry, that Paul stayed with Peter. I kind of doubt that's what he's saying, because he didn't say I stayed with him. He just said, I saw him. So, you know, he would probably see him, you know, like you and I see people when we get together for church, what it is, is what he's saying. <clears throat> and so uh, he, he really didn't have time to get his education from them. Now, it says in verse 20, Galatians 1, he says, Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Why would he say that? Because they thought that he'd be lying. That, that they would have a hard time believing that Paul didn't learn his gospel, that Paul didn't get his gospel from anywhere else. They would have a hard time learning that or believing that, especially when you understand Paul's former manner of life. From his more former manner of life, he needed some education. He needed, he needed some, you know, some change in his attitude and change in his thinking. He's been brainwashed all this time. And so he's going to have, he's going to need some, some radical teaching. Uh, and, and so it'd be hard for them to believe that he's not lying. So that's why he says, look, I'm not lying. You know, now here's the thing. If Paul was a, uh, even if Paul was just a Christian, a Christian Christian, and he's trying to preach, okay, is it okay for us to lie? No. So even as a Christian, Paul's not, you know, not making things up. And so he's pointing out that even if you're just a Christian, what he's telling you is the truth. He's telling you the truth because he doesn't lie. He's not supposed to lie, and he understands he's not supposed to lie. Then it says in, in Galatians 1 and verse 21, then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So he went from there to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. And let me see if I can find what I want here. Where, where is that? Uh, there it is right there. Uh-huh. So, so he goes back up to Syria and Cilicia. Now, if you look at your map that you have that has his first missionary journey, uh, what major town is in Cilicia? Look at your map and tell me what major town is in Cilicia. Uh, I'm sorry. There's a there's a major town in Cilicia. Starts with a T. Tarsus. Now, what do you remember about Tarsus? Saul of Tarsus. So Saul grew up there. So once once Paul gets an opportunity to go and preach somewhere after he's you know done what the Lord wants him to do, he goes home. He goes home to Cilicia because no doubt he wants to preach to his family. No doubt he wants them to, to know the message about God. So he goes to Cilicia after these 15 days. He goes over to Cilicia, and that's where we find him when the 
Barnabas comes looking for him in Acts 11. Go to Acts 11. This is the first time the disciples were called Christians. Remember, they were called Christians in Antioch, right? Okay. But over here, if you take a look at, uh, you know, where do I want? Right here, verse 19. This is Acts eleven nineteen. It says, so then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in, the, in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cy Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching uh, the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number uh, who believed turned to the Lord. So they're preaching to these people that are in Antioch of Pisidia. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, that are in Antioch there of Syria. There's two Antiochs. This is the Anti uh, 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 Antioch of, of um, yeah, of, of Syria. And, and so they're, they're, they're preaching to them. And what do they find? Uh, what do they uh, do, these people that are here? Yeah, and you know, you know, uh, okay, uh, so it says uh, that many of them believe. So you'd have, you'd have what we call the Gentile church. Now, verse uh, uh, Acts eleven twenty two says, and the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. So they sent Barnabas to go help them. <clears throat> What's Barnabas's name mean? encourager so they sent the, they send the encourager to go encourage them verse 23 says and when the when he arrived and witnessed the grace of god he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute hearts remain true to the lord so he began to teach them to remain true to the church he encouraged them to remain true to the church no to, to stay true to the lord Stay true to the Lord. If you stay true to the Lord, you will be God's church. That's what you need to remember. The emphasis is not stay loyal to the church. The emphasis is stay loyal to Jesus. All right. So then it says, <clears throat> uh, at verse 22, and the news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. And when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced uh, and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. So again, there you see the word grace. And you see the word Jesus connected. It's the grace of being able to have a relationship with God. <clears throat> okay. And so he says, <clears throat> verse 24, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and considerable um, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord, and he, he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. So where did he go? Where did Barnabas go? He went to Tarsus, because that's the last place we find Paul at, is at Cilicia, in Tar Tarsus and Cilicia. And verse 26 says, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were, were first called Christians in Antioch. So here... After these 15 days, uh, we find Paul going to Cilicia. I'm just going to put Tarsus up here. Going to Tarsus. And then Paul takes him from Tarsus to Antioch. And that's where, that's where we find Paul in the very last part of um, Galatians chapter uh, 1. But now, I want you to read a little bit more with me, if you would, in Acts 11. <clears throat> Verse uh, 27, Acts eleven twenty-seven. 27. Now, at this time, while he's in Antioch, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the portion that any of the disciples had means each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. 
And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So uh, I'm going to move Paul's first missionary journey over here because I didn't leave enough room. <clears throat> and so here's Paul's first missionary journey. Okay, but from Antioch, we find out that Paul goes to Jerusalem. Okay, he goes to Jerusalem. What does he go to Jerusalem for? Because he's, he's, they're sending help to the brethren in Judea who are going to have trouble because there's a famine coming. Right? Everybody following me? I know it's kind of messy up there, but hopefully you can follow me. Now, back to Galatians. <clears throat> now, verse 22. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted, the, uh, persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. So they hadn't seen Paul as, he, as he's writing this to them. He said that they hadn't seen Paul face to face. They heard about Paul. They heard about the fact that this, this uh, persecutor is now preaching the faith which he once destroyed. They heard about him, but they didn't see him. They didn't know him by face because he hadn't been there enough. The only time he'd been there is up here when he was in Jerusalem, right? And then this is the second time when he would have come down here and given money to the, to the elders of the churches in Judea. Uh, and, and by the way, it's not just the church in Jerusalem that he gave money to, it's the churches in Judea. There were a number of churches. So he probably stopped by and said, here's, you know, here's, here's your part of the funds we collected. Then he'd go to another church, kind of like what we would do when we would go into Central America. And some of you brethren would send uh, a poverty support. We would um, uh, meet with the elders and you know the churches that we would go to, and we would say, "Here's here's a portion of the of the money so that you guys can use it for for the poor." Then we go to another church and we'd do the same thing over there, and we wouldn't spend a long time in each group. You know, we wouldn't spend weeks there. We'd just spend a day and then go to the next one. And so uh, even some of the even some of the churches we left money uh, at, they have no idea what we look like. Uh, they, you know, they they don't know us. You know face to face because we didn't spend a lot of time there. And so that's also what Paul's telling them. So even though he came down here to Jerusalem a second time, they really didn't know him. You know, he hadn't, he hadn't been there enough to where they spent time with him and they would know, oh, that's Paul. Okay. Now, yeah, they heard about him. That's right. They heard about him. Uh, and, and, and that's why it says in Galatians 1.23, but only that they kept hearing he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So the, the church then could glorify God. Now, I, I, I didn't get your, your material for chapter two, but let me get into chapter two and kind of tie this in a, a little bit later, uh, uh, you know, for a little bit. Now, it says in Galatians 2.1, then after an interval of 14 years, I went up to, uh, again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. Now, when's the second time that Paul, on our chart here, when's the second time that Paul would have gone to Jerusalem? Okay. When's the second time Paul would have gone to Jerusalem? What? Right here. Right, right here. Taking the money from Antioch. The first time was after he came out of Tarsus, I mean, sorry, after he came out of Damascus and he went and stayed with Paul 15, uh, stayed with Peter 15 days, right? And, and then you have him going over here to the church in Antioch and spending some time there and preaching with those people for quite a while. And then there was a revelation about the poor people in Jerusalem. And so Paul took money down there. So this would be the second time, right? Okay. And this, this uh, missionary journey, uh, would have happened in between, I, I got in the wrong place. This missionary journey would have happened, sorry, let me fix this. This journey would have happened right in here, before this. This is when his first journey is. 
Over here, you have Acts 15. Now, what happens in Acts 15? Okay, so there was a discussion about circumcision. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this is because some people think that this discussion in Acts cha in Galatians chapter 2 about circumcision happened in Acts 15 and happened uh, uh, 14 years later and, and is the meeting that you have in uh, um, uh, Galatians chapter 2 is this meeting that you have in Acts 15. Okay. In Acts 15, it says, well, let's just read a couple of verses in it, and then I'll try to tie it together with you if it's not too confusing. I don't want to confuse you, but I'm good at that sometimes. In Acts 15, 1, it says, some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So Acts 15 tells us of this council they had with Paul, Barnabas, and the apostles. And that question about circumcision happened right here. And some people believe that Galatians 2 is talking about this period. The problem with that is this would be Paul's third visit. It'd be his third visit to Jerusalem. This is happening during his second visit to Jerusalem. Okay, so I, I want to suggest to you that Galatians chapter 2 is happening right here, right here. It's happening right there, not here in Acts 15, but right here, which would be before Acts 15. It would be when Paul came down with the money to distribute. Okay, now, let me give you some reasons why I believe that. Um, looking at Galatians chapter 1. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 2. It says, after an interval of about 14 years, I went again to, uh, up to Jerusalem. So we've got 14 years from here to here. From, from here to here. We've got 14 years. Okay, And uh, you can work the chronology out to where it, where it can work. I'm not going to go through and, and do all that. Uh, but what I want you to notice is it says, and uh, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also. So who went with him? Barnabas and Titus. Now, somebody says, well, over here, when they took the money to Jerusalem, it doesn't say Titus went with them. That doesn't mean he wasn't with them. It just means he wasn't mentioned, okay, when they took the money down. But we know Titus was with them. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, no. No. Um, we know Titus was with them here because Galatians chapter 2 tells us that. And it says, and it was because of a revelation that I went up. And here in Galatians 2, it says he went to Jerusalem because of a revelation. Does anybody know of any revelation in Acts chapter 15 that says go to Jerusalem? No. Does anybody know a revelation that might get them to go to Jerusalem in Acts 11? Barnabas signified that there would be a great famine. So there's a revelation. So they're going over to Jerusalem by revelation or because of a revelation they're going. <clears throat> uh, not only that, but I want you to notice down here in Galatians chapter 2 and down here at verse um, 10. I'm going to look at Galatians 2.10. Galatians 2.10 says, talking about after, the, after they have this discussion, it says, they only asked us to remember the poor. The very thing I also was eager to do. So here, in the second visit to Jerusalem, why was Paul going there? To remember the poor. And so after they have this discussion in Galatians 2, the, uh, uh, Peter and James say, oh, and by the way, remember the poor. And Paul says, I've been doing that. That's what I've been doing. I'm remembering the poor. I'm helping the poor. So the other thing is, once we get all the way into, into Galatians chapter 2, you're going to find out that in, in, in uh, 
in Acts 15, there is no discussion There is no controversy between Paul and the and the apostles. In other words, there there's no secret meeting uh, in in Acts 15. There there is a meeting in in Galatians 2 where they meet together. Paul meets with the apostles or meets with Peter for the first time and shares his gospel. Okay. And so, therefore, I w- I'm going to suggest to you that Galatians is the, is the events that happened here when they went down to take money to Jerusalem. And that's, that's when it happened. It's not over here in Acts 15. In Acts 15, the, there was no discussion between the apostles. They were all in agreement with everything and with, and with, with Paul. Over here, they, they had a little bit of, of discussion about it, okay, because Titus was with them, and they wanted Titus to be circumcised. And Paul said no, and so he met with he met with uh, Peter and and James, um, and they all decided Paul's right. He's okay the way he is, and so you, you, you have two different circumstances. So I want to suggest to you that Galatians chapter two is this event here when Paul went down to take money, and that's when Titus was with them, and that's where this discussion came up that we're going to be looking at next week. All right, any questions or thoughts? I want to make a correction. Sure. Because when I feel a little uncomfortable, sometimes I go and do the research. Sure. Edom, yes, right. Over in Numbers 20. Right. Yeah, I I figured it was either Moab uh, Moab or Edom, one of the two. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anything else? Ben, you have anything? (laughs) All right. Okay. Nothing else. Then let's have ourselves a prayer and we can be dismissed. Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your book. We thank you so much for helping us understand that Paul was a true apostle and We thank you for the history that we find in it, that we can verify. We just praise you for blessing us and giving us everything that we need in order to believe in you and to serve you. Pray that you help us to put our trust in you and in what you tell us. We pray you forgive us for our sins and bless us on our way home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sure.